Welcome to the second of our 2020 Fridays at Nye House series from Nye House. Uh, dysgraphia is more than messy handwriting. My name is Mary North. I'm the director of the Family Support Office at Nye House. Our goal at Nye House is to promote reading success by teaching teachers about the science of reading, by providing information and resources to parents about reading, and providing classes for adults who want to improve their reading and spelling. Before we get started, we are so uh, excited to have uh, Brenda Taylor here. Let's see here. <laughs> and there she is. I am uh, pleased to introduce you to Dr. Brenda Taylor, a longtime friend of and former student at Nyhouse Education Center. Dr. Taylor has a wide and deep experience in education as a teacher, an educational diagnostician, a dyslexia specialist and an educational consultant. She lives in College Station and earned her PhD at Texas A&M. She's a certified academic language therapist, CALT, with a license as a Texas dyslexia therapist. She also served as dyslexia consultant for the state of Texas for several years. In these roles, she's presented at many state and national conferences, and we're extremely fortunate to have her with us today. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Brenda Taylor. Thank you, Mary. And, um, and hopefully you can, everyone can see my screen. So um, I would like to, well, first of all, good morning, everyone. And I would like to thank Nyhouse Education Center and especially Mary North and Suze Hall for inviting me to talk with you about dysgraphia today. So we will get started. Oops, for some reason that didn't click. Oh, well, let's do that. <laughs> all right, so today we're going to cover definitions um, that will be discussed, terms, the definition of terms that I'll discuss today. We'll uh, talk about skills involved in handwriting, some at-risk characteristics, difficulties that we see with students with handwriting issues. And then uh, because the state of Texas has um, a definition that relates dyslexia and dysgraphia. We'll look at how that relationship uh, can be looked at, and then we'll end with some slides on how we can help. So this is a figure that illustrates the simple view of reading. Uh, I'm sorry, simple view of writing. And as you can see, there are three major components, one of them at each point of the triangle. One of those is transcription, which includes foundational skills, which will be the focus of our conversation today. Transcription skills include handwriting, spelling, and keyboarding. Another component is text generation, which is closely related to an individual's language skills. And finally, executive functions. Executive functions involved in writing include first planning what you're going to write, organizing the information, initiating the writing task, persisting with the writing task, self-monitoring during the writing task, reviewing information, inhibiting what is not relevant, and switching attention between tasks as you're writing, just to name a few. And at the center of the writing process is working memory, which makes a lot of sense since there's a lot of juggling of skills that goes on during the writing process. Working memory assists with the efficient flow of cognitive skills that are involved. It's important to understand that each point of the triangle is equally important. There's not one that is more important than the other. All are needed for an individual to be an efficient, effective writer. Dysgraphia derives from the Greek language and means the condition of impaired letter form production by hand. And I think it's important to really notice that impaired letter form production. So that's one of the key things that we'll be discussing and looking at. 
Now, if a student has a physical impairment or a developmental disorder that includes difficulties with fine motor skills that affect writing, this would not be considered dysgraphia. Like other learning disabilities, and dysgraphia is considered a learning disability, there is an unexpectedness with dysgraphia. So students with dysgraphia will have overall motor functions within, a norm, within, within normal limits. In other words, they don't have anything else that is going on that we would we, that we would consider that they would have handwriting issues. It's kind of unexpected for them. But they do. Although students with dysgraphia, just like students in general or students with dyslexia, there can be individual differences. So, for example, there could be students that have more difficulty with placement of the letters on the line or maintaining consistency of letter size as they write. The transcription skill that has been found to be most unique to students with dysgraphia is automatic retrieval and production of legible letters. So that goes back to that impairment of letter form production that we talked about. Now I'm going to review some terms that I'll be using as we discuss handwriting issues and dysgraphia in general. But first, I'm going to briefly review some information related to learning to read words. And hopefully you'll see how this connects as we move forward. Before children understand letters and sounds, they use visual cues to read words, such as knowing that on a red sign that they see while their parents are driving says stop, not because they can read the word stop, but because they know that sign sign means stop or being able to read the word Coke on a Coke can. But if we took those out and put them just on a piece of paper, they probably wouldn't be able to read them. So there's really not a whole lot of knowledge of sound symbol association at this point. But as they begin learning letters and the sounds associated with them, then they begin to use that to decode words. And this moves from a partial alphabetic phase on through to a consolidated alphabetic phase where they know more sound to symbol associations and, and they're starting to uh, chunk more of those within words as they read. Eventually, this leads to what we call an automatic phase. These are our proficient readers and they're automatic in their word reading. Now let's look at how this works in the reading brain. Although this figure is simplified, the beginning stages of reading rely heavily on these areas, the frontal lobe and the parietotemporal lobe, which are associated with, one, discerning the sounds in our language, which we call phonology, and slow decoding of words. We know that all beginning readers start out decoding pretty slow. We also know that struggling readers continue that slow reading, and these are the areas that are primarily used for um, that work that they do while they're learning to read. Now, the brain region that is that is associated with automatic word reading is this one down here towards the back of the brain called the occipitotemporal area, and it's commonly uh, referred to as the word form area. This would be associated with that automatic phase of reading from the previous slide. Once students have learn the sound symbol associations and they've decoded a lot of words and they've seen those words and they've decoded them and they finally gotten to the to the point of being skilled readers and we know that some students that takes longer than others to get to that automatic phase then this is the area of the brain from brain imaging that they've done that is working harder 
And so basically what that means is after all of that instruction and experience with words, they've been able to store them in this part of the brain. And we call that part of the reading process orthographic processing. Now, is in orthographic processing, one of the things that I just referred to is orthographic memory. So instruction in reading causes this specialized area of the brain to become uh, visible on uh, on uh, brain scans. It's very specialized. It's it's not just visual memory. It's very specialized to the letter patterns in word spellings. It's specialized to the letters. And we know that students, that it that it's involved in that reading process. But we also know that students use those letters for writing and spelling. So orthographic memory is an important part of both reading and writing. So it's, it's where they've stored those letters and those words that they've learned in that occipitotemporal area of their brain. Now, orthographic coding is when they pull a letter or a word into their mind's eye and they hold it there while they analyze the letter patterns in them. Now, depending on how quick they write or how uh, automatic they're writing, they may have to hold it in that mind's eye for a lot longer than others who are very automatic. And, and those of us who are automatic don't even realize we're doing it. But I'm going to give you a little practice with some orthographic coding. So I'm going to show you a word for several seconds. Don't write it down. Just study it visually. And then once the word disappears, I'll ask you some questions about the word and you can you can just kind of think about your answers and then I'll review it. So here we go. Okay, so what was the fourth letter in the word? Was there an A in the word? How many E's were in the word? How many S's were in the word? So let's look at it. The fourth letter was C. There is an A. There are two E's and two S's. Now, I made that a little more challenging for you, but that gives you an idea of how you have to hold that information in your mind's eye to answer those questions. Now then, we use that information that we have in that orthographic area of our brain, the occipitotemporal and for whatever letter or word that we want to write, we have to pull it from our memory. We have to retrieve it. We have to hold it in our mind's eye. And then we have to connect it to the motor movements. And this is called the orthographic loop. It connects the head to the hand. Now, graphomotor skills are... are movements, coordination of hand and finger movements that we use specifically for writing. So motor, of course, we understand that graph relates to, to letters. So it's the motor skills that we use for writing letters or for writing. If there is a dysfunction in those graphomotor skills, then it typically only affects written language. So that kind of goes back to what I mentioned earlier, they may still be able to draw. They may still be able to tie their shoes. They may not have any problems with cutting, cutting out things and uh, buttoning buttons, but we see it in their written language. It affects those motor movements used for writing. So to review, prior to writing, although we don't realize we do it because it happens so quickly, if whenever we're ready to write, whether it's a letter or a word, we name and retrieve that letter 
or word. We store it in our mind's eye, and then we plan the how we're going to form it. Then we connect it to the graphomotor skills, those motor movements that are used to form letters. And then we also use our spatial skills to judge the amount of space needed between the letters and words and to try to position letters on the line. So those are the skills that are used in writing. Now we're going to talk about some at-risk characteristics. So we kind of talked about how the writing process works from head to hand. So now we're going to talk about things you may see in a student's writing. So if you recall, an, an identifying characteristic of dysgraphia is automatic retrieval and production of legible letters. So let's talk about letter formation first. One of the things that we can look at is whether a student has excessive erasures and or strike overs. Um, so this particular sample that I have here doesn't necessarily have excessive erasures, but we do see some strike overs like in the word out here and in, uh, well, that's not the G, Something happened right here with the S. It's a little hard. The reason why there may we may see that, now we may see it more with little kids as they're learning to write, but we also see that with students who have writing difficulties because it could be that whatever they've pulled up in their mind's eye doesn't match when they see it on the paper. And so they're like, oh, that's not right. So they erase or they write over it. So that's why we may see some of that. The next thing is we may see a mixture of upper and lowercase letters. This one is not uh, full of that, but we do see an uppercase D right here. For some reason, the student is able to write lowercase Ds, but this one is uppercase. This P looks more like a lowercase, but this one looks more like an uppercase. Students may, we may see this again, we may see this more commonly with young students beginning to write. But as they become uh, more practiced on the difference between upper and lowercase letters, then we should see them use those appropriately. We may, uh, I know that I continue to see a mixture with some of my kiddos that I work with because they know exactly what a, 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 cup, a capital Q looks like. But when you go to a lowercase Q, it's like, okay, well, which way does the circle go? Which way is, you know, so sometimes you see it on those letters that they confuse. So you may see capital B's and capital D's and capital P's and capital Q's. Even sometimes the P's are uh, reversed because those are the ones that they typically have a little more difficulty with. So sometimes um, the capital letter is more automatic for them because we typically learn how to write those letters first before we uh, move to the lowercase. Another thing that we may see, and this one is probably um, a, a very important one since it's related to letter formation, is we see a real inconsistency in their letter formation and or slant. When you've developed your handwriting, it tends to be pretty consistent in how you form letters as well as slant. So let's start with W. On this first row, we see a W here in the second word, which is pretty nicely formed. We go down the line and we see another W, which looks nice, but it's different than this W. Then we go on to the this word and we see another W, which we can tell it's a W, but it's different than this one and it's different than this one. And then we go on down to this W, which again is different. So in one row, we have four W's that are all formed differently. Let's look at the student's ends. This is a, a, a passage about the snow and um, making snow angels and so forth. So we know that this word is snowing, but it actually looks like showing because this looks like an H instead of an N. And then we have not, which also looks like an H, but looks a little different than this one. This actually does look like an N, and this looks 
a little more like an N than an H. And this looks like an N, but it's a lot bigger. So we can see that there's definitely inconsistencies in how the student is forming the letter N. And another one that I uh, especially like is the D. This is a D. We know it's a D because that's the word day. However, if we took that out and we put it over here by itself and we ask someone, what is this? I think a lot of people might say, well, that looks like a two. So this is really what we would consider illegible because it doesn't look like what it's supposed to look like. Um, and, and perhaps even we could even say that N is too, as it looks like an H. So, but we also see that that tends to be a little more consistent, but still there are some differences in how it is formed, but still kind of has that look of two. So that gives you three different examples of incons inconsistent letter formation. Now slant basically just means the direction. So we can see this I kind of slants a little to the right, but then we see this B slants a little bit to the left, and then we see some letters that are more up and down. So that inconsistency in the slant also tells us that um, the student hasn't automatized their uh, letter formations yet. Another thing we may see are irregular letter sizes, and we certainly see it in this one. Uh, for some reason, they always start out the beginning of their sentences with pretty large letters, but then as you can see, some of them get pretty small, and then some of it's very inconsistent. We have some larger ones here. And one other thing that's not necessarily related to letter formation that I want to point out that you might want to pay attention to because it does make some reading difficult um, for students. I mean, reading of writing that students do is their spacing. So um, right here, the child has some nice spacing between their letters, but then it just kind of goes away as they go down the line. And this just looks one, like one long word. So the, the spacing is very inconsistent, not only between words, but within words. Um, the spacing in the word down here looks fine. But then if we go to uh, some other words, it's much it's there's not a whole lot of space between the words. So a lot of inconsistency in the spacing. Some other reasons that student, some other at-risk characteristics are the rate. Um, most of the time, I would say most commonly, they have a slower rate, but that, but there may be some students that just write excessively fast. We also will see, we may see some attention uh, issues and it's, um, this may be for different reasons. It could be that if they have problems with pulling it up in their head or seeing it in their mind's eye, they're like, like, well, you know, I don't know what to write. You know, I mean, it just looks like they're having attention issues, but the problem is it's just, they just really <laughs> are like, what do I write? Um, the other thing is, if you have a student who you've asked to do composing, if they have problems with initiating a task, then we may, that may also look like some attention issues. They're just kind of sitting there not doing what they're supposed to be doing, but they're just, they just don't know how to get started with the task. Um, we also may see endurance issues. If they're slow and it's effortful and it takes a lot of concentration and a lot of work, well, that tires them out. And so they become fatigued and they just need a lot more encouragement from the teacher for their writing. Then another thing we may see is an over-reliance on vision. And I'll talk a little bit more about why that could occur uh, as we go forward. Now then, a great way to get some idea of whether a student is automatic in their letter writing is just have them write the alphabet. The alphabet is composed of the only letters that we use in writing, for writing letters, for writing words. Those are the only 20, 26 letters we use. So how automatic is that child in, in pulling it up and connecting it to those letter formations? So 
is a great way to screen in schools. It's also a very easy thing to have your child do and to look at how automatic they are in pulling those letters and writing them from memory. Now, if you do this, you really do want to cover any kind of a, 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 a alphabet strip or anything that might be visible that they could copy from because copying is different than retrieving it from their memory. But it is a, a very strong predictor of future composition length and quality as they uh, develop through um, their school career. So I'm going to show you some examples of kiddos that I've worked with. And typically when I start working with them as a dyslexia therapist, I always do an informal assessment the first uh, session. And so this is a little guy that I worked with this summer after second grade, and this was his alphabet. Now it took him over, slightly over two minutes to write alphabet, which really for the summer after second grade is too long um, that because, and one of my observations was that he had to keep beginning at A every time. So, you know, if you get, maybe that's okay if you're right here at C or D, but if you get over here to M and you're having to start A, B, C, D, all the way to figure out which letter, that just takes up a lot of time. So that shows that his, his alphabet in it, in and of itself, it's not automatic. So that's another thing that's uh, beneficial to work on. But we can see that when he got to D, he made a G, he crossed it out, but then he still didn't know how to make the D. So I just encouraged him to go on. Um, there's a difficulty here. It looks like he put a P and then wrote over it. The P is capital, the Q is capital, and the Z is reversed. Although, except for this, it's sequenced, although not automatic. Now, if we look at his letter formations, as I noticed, we had some capital letters and reversal, but this is considered illegible. Uh, we know it's an A because it's the first letter there, but if we took it out of context, it would look more like an O and Actually, I don't know. I'm kind of, it almost looks like a, a face with a little curl on its head. I mean, you know, who knows what they would. But I think, you know, we've got to look at those things. If, you know, if the student is writing this, the letter A all the time, then it could very easily be confused as an O in their writing. Now, the next one I want to show you is a, a little boy that I've been working with since January, actually. And this is uh, during the summer after his kindergarten year. Now, we initially had to work on the oral alphabet before we ever got to the writing. But in um, the beginning of the summer, I had him write the alphabet. And you can see some very good things, and I was very, very proud of him, is that his B and D were going the right way. And he does have the order, but his J is reversed. His P is reversed. It's also a capital. Q is a capital. And um, so... It took him 11 minutes to, to write this, so definitely not automatic, and he's a little guy that when he comes to the letters, like, for instance, F and G, he knows it's F, but you can tell he has no idea what it looks like, and uh, it's not like he hasn't been exposed to it, and we haven't practiced with it. He just gets to F, and he, he can't remember what it looks like, and he'll tell you that. I don't remember what it looks like. So I had to use a lot of verbal cues with him. Like G was always around like an A, down, hook. And sometimes when he'd get to that and he just couldn't, that's all I had to say, and then he could write it. Well, I want to show you one that he just did. This was last week. And you can see that a lot of his letter formations have really, really improved. And he's much more automatic. When he comes to F, he can write it. When he comes to G, he can write it. And it only took him just a little less than two minutes to do this. And um, the only thing was his P. And um, But anyway, we, we celebrated um, after that. So... Okay, so let's talk about some handwriting difficulties. We're going to start out with some that are specifically motor related. These are graphomotor difficulties, difficulties with the motor skills, the coordination of those skills for handwriting. 
One of those is motor memory. Handwriting is a motor skill. It's not a drawing skill, it's a motor skill. And just like with any motor skill, like learning to dance, we have to be instructed of the motor movements and we have to practice with those motor movements to become skilled. For students who may have motor memory issues, they're weak at recalling those uh, motor skills or, those, or the motor plan for forming a letter or they may be weak at maintaining the plan in their head as they're writing. So there may be some fluctuation. And it, that means in the middle of forming a letter, they may forget how, how it's supposed to be formed. These children may prefer the use of manuscript because in manuscript, there's 26 capital, 26 lowercase, that's it, that's all. But when you go to cursive, depending on the word you're writing and the connections and the letters in the word, there it can be written lots of different ways. So these are students, as they get older, they may tell you that they prefer manuscript. It also represents the most common graphomotor difficulty. Another one is motor implementation or production which involves, uh, when writing, we use a lot of different motor movements. We use horizontal movements, vertical movements, rotary movements. We use uh, muscles to stabilize the pencil. We use muscles to move the pencil, to form the letters. And so students with motor production issues have difficulty assigning or using those muscles um, that are responsible during letter formation. Now, they may, because of that, enlist uh, the muscles in their wrist, uh, their larger muscles in the wrist or forearm or maybe even shoulder to help them better control their fine motor muscles. And these children may, not always, but may have a history of articulation difficulties because we also have to assign those um, muscles in our mouth to produce letters. Uh, or to, you know, articulate the letters, so, or sounds, should I say. So, uh, like I said, it's just, you know, if you have a student who has some articulation difficulties and you're seeing difficulties with handwriting, then it could be that there's a connection, but it doesn't always, uh, doesn't always have to, or it doesn't always have to be. And then the last one is motor feedback. And so, writing, when we're writing, it depends on getting feedback, uh, a sensation of movement, knowing where your hand or your fingers are while you're writing. Children with this difficulty, since they don't receive the feedback that they need from their fingers, they'll closely monitor their writing with their vision. Their eyes will be held very, very close to the paper uh, to watch their writing hand. Their writing may be legible, especially as they begin uh, writing, but it, it will definitely be slower and take a lot of effort. It, it requires a lot of concentration, so endurance may be an issue for these kiddos. It may all, their handwriting may also get messier as they write. They also may compensate by really gripping hard on the pencil or writing uh, with great pressure on the paper to get some uh, feedback. Now, in addition to motor problems that can cause handwriting issues, we also have a non-motor difficulty that can cause handwriting. In other words, it doesn't have anything to do with the motor. It has to do with weak orthographic processing skills. So basically, the difficulty that they're having is up here either in being able to store the letters and the words in their orthographic memory or having difficulty retrieving them, having difficulty holding them in their mind's eye, having difficulty keeping it, keeping it in their mind's eye while they're uh, connecting it to the, the, to the motor movements. And so the problem is not here, it's going to be here, but it causes a disconnection in the orthographic loop. So we will see 
problems in their handwriting. Now, this, uh, these are some questions that can be used as an informal checklist that you can use to look at a student's writing samples. Or um, if you're real familiar with the student and how they write, you can respond to these questions. And I would really suggest that you use more than one writing sample that you kind of look at a pattern of these issues. But this is a sample from a little girl. She was... Uh, in the spring of her third grade year, and this was a, a science paper. And so one of the questions to think about for orthographic processing would be, um, do they have difficulty spelling irregular words? The reason why is because irregular words just have to, we just have to remember the order of the letters in those irregular words, like said, because it's S-A-I-D, but that's not the way it sounds. It sounds like S-E-D, short E, eh. So we do see one right here, what, which is spelled as it sounds, but then we also see another one, put, which is an irregular word, which is spelled correctly. So um, this is where we would want to see more of a pattern uh, for her. Forgets how letters look. So again, we're going to see inconsistent letter formations as we talked about before with the other sample. We may see ongoing reversals um, with their B's and D's, particularly those letters that are visually similar. Students uh, with orthographic processing may have more trouble copying from the book or the board because it requires some holding of that information in your mind's eye. And since they have difficulty doing it, they're constantly looking up and down and up and down and up and down. And obviously, if they're having to write a lot, it causes them to lose their place. And anyway, so it's much more difficult for them. They tend to spell the same word in different ways. And we can see that skillet is a word. Here she starts out with S-K-I-L-I-T. This one is spelled correctly. And then this one is spelled differently. We also see um, some difference in the word change. She spells it correctly here. Down here, she loses the E. And then when she wants to add suffixes, changes and changed, she uh, is not quite sure about that. So that's really related more to, to some morphological issues, which morphology refers to the meaningful parts of our language when we add prefixes and suffixes to words. Okay, then... Um, Spells words how they sound rather than how they look, and this is just full of that. So I'll just, and, and fried is also a morphological thing here, but like physical, definitely the way it sounds, the word heat, definitely the way it sounds. Um, uh, there's all kinds of it. Molecule stays the way it sounds. So we're seeing a lot of that, very phonetic spelling. Now, here is a just very basic uh, table that gives some information about um, uh, dysgraphia and dyslexia and how they can be related. In the state law of Texas, it says that dysgraphia is related to dyslexia. So I am going to preface this by saying it's only related to dyslexia if it's a language-based problem. That means it would be a non-motor problem. Now, it could be a combination. They could have problems with orthographic processing and motor skills, but if it's due to motor skills only, it would not be related to dyslexia. Because dyslexia is a language-based difficulty, it would need to be a language-based difficulty to be related to dyslexia. So dysgraphia is a difficulty with the foundational skills of letter writing. Dyslexia is a difficulty with the lower level or the foundational skills of word reading. The language problems that cause this are phonology predominantly, but we need phonology and orthography to read words. For dysgraphia, it's typically just orthography. 
It can interfere with spelling. We know dyslexia does interfere with spelling. Now, just like in dyslexia, reading comprehension is a secondary consequence. Written expression will also be a secondary consequence. A lot of these kids may have good ability to give you their stories orally, but once they have to start writing it, it's like just completely different. Or they just have a lot of struggle. Um, students with dysgraphia only will not have difficulties with reading. And students with dyslexia may also have difficulties with handwriting. So basically, what we need to understand here is that you don't have to have both. You can be and have dysgraphia without dyslexia. You can have it all by itself. You can have dyslexia all by itself, but you certainly can have students who have a difficulty with both. Now, I know that uh, time may be an issue, so I do have some uh, slides that I put in here on how to help. You do have the slides, so I'll probably move through these just a little faster. This first slide gives information from the Understanding Dysgraphia Fact Sheet from the International Dyslexia Association. It just gives some uh, activities to help strengthen their hand muscles to develop motor control, uh, to assist with letter formations. Uh, since I talked about alphabet, one of the things that I have found has been really beneficial with the kiddos that I've worked with is to really work on that alphabetical order. If they don't automatically know their alphabet uh, orally, then that's where you want to start. When that gets a little better, move into, uh, and, and of course, work on their letter formations at the same time, but then start working on that automatic um, sequencing. So uh, just letter recognizing first, sequencing, uh, working on letter formations. And now with the little guy that I shared, uh, this made so much progress, I'm starting to use these handwriting activities from Nyhouse, instant letters, memory letters, copying to help assist uh, him with his writing. Now, Interventions for the alphabet, if you have them do the alphabet, and if you notice some of these things, here are some things you can do. If you see additions, uh, letters that they've added or letters that they've omitted or substituted, have them name or write the letter that comes after the designated letter. So work on that alphabet sequencing. For mixing case formats, really categorize categorizing and working with uh, upper and lower case. We're doing concentration games and there's lots of different games you can do to help them really become more familiar with those. Um, if they're slow at retrieving, which means they have to always begin at A, then you want to um, help them first become more automatic in that sequencing, but then uh, practice writing the alphabet from memory so that um, that time is gradually uh, decreased. You always want to work on accuracy of letter production first, then move to automaticity, and then to keyboarding. So for accuracy, children need explicit modeling of how the letter is formed, and you can describe how letters are similar and different to other letters, giving them practice on tracing, copying, writing the letter from memory. You also want to monitor their handwriting and give them corrections uh, so that it doesn't become automatized, uh, particularly if it's, it's not correct. One of the things that research has found to be very beneficial for automaticity is giving them an opportunity to study numbered arrow cues. And sometimes you may have verbal cues that go along with this. And certainly these are things you can use to develop automaticity, I'm sorry, accuracy at first, but then to add the automaticity to it, giving them a chance to study it and then covering it with an index card or your hand at first, just a very short amount of time, like one to three seconds and then having them write the letter from memory. That helps establish the, that orthographic coding, being able to hold it in their mind's eye. And you can work up to eight to 10 seconds before you have them write the letter. So after they have 
studied the numbered error cues and you held a index card over it for a few seconds or more, then they would write the letter. And research has also shown that this procedure can be um, good to use for students with reversals. Writing letters from dictation, so that helps the spoken name uh, attach more um, instantly to the letter form. Now, another thing is very short practice sessions, uh, not having them write a whole page of the same letter. So you only want to give them about uh, five to eight practice uh, times with the letter and then to move into more authentic uh, writing activities, even if it's just writing a short sentence. Now, in handwriting, if you see retracings that reflect um, some graphomotor planning, then you want to retrain letter formations. If emphasize a consistent sequence using either numbered arrow cues or verbal cues. The same thing uh, if you uh, see reversals. And we talked about that a little bit earlier. Keyboarding, uh, we found that keyboarding is something we need to start introducing a little younger to kids, not just kids with handwriting problems, but any students. So the Institute of Educational Sciences has a practice guide for effective writing for elementary students. And they have really recommended that you introduce typing in the first grade, begin regular typing practice in second, so that by the end of second, and definitely third grade that students can type as fast as they can write by hand. Now, real quickly related to spelling, spelling requires good orthographic memory. So this is why you can have a student who has the ability to read, but still has a lot of trouble with spelling. It also requires integrating um, all of these different skills that we've touched on, phonology, morphology, and the orthographic knowledge. It requires explicit instruction. It's also more difficult than reading. And so unfortunately in our schools sometimes, and we do see this changing, thankfully, that spelling and handwriting become very minimized or sometimes just uh, taken off uh, the agenda. But we really need to uh, make sure that we're pro providing good instruction for both um, uh, writing and spelling. Because for students with dyslexia, they have a triple disadvantage as they compose, primarily due to spelling. It causes a lack of fluency because when they get to a word that they don't know how to spell, then they pause and they have to think about it. And if they can't think of how to spell the word that they want to spell, then many times they uh, change it to a very simplified, like from humongous to the word big, which... Uh, so it doesn't really represent their oral language. And then finally, because they're having to pause frequently, uh, that, as we've talked about, inter interferes with the fluency, but they tend to also have to pause more often uh, so that there's not as much written information provided between pauses. So this is why we say that it can affect both the quality the word choices they use in the quantity because it just they just can't get it as much down on paper because they're pausing so often. And the last handout that I gave you uh, or that I provided is from a website called the High Incidence Accessible Technology, Hyatt. It's uh, affiliated with the Montgomery County Public Schools in the Northeast. But they um, have come to the conclusion that there's a lot of kids out there in the general ed classrooms that have problems with handwriting that don't, they're not either in special ed or they don't qualify for services uh, like OT services. So it just lists some uh, no tech options, low tech options, and high tech options, which I thought might be helpful for both parents and school personnel. And lastly, I do want to emphasize the fact that special ed at the federal level has said that there is nothing in the special ed law that would prohibit the use of the terms dyslexia or dysgraphia in 
um, an evaluation, in eligibility determinations, or in IEP documents. So please uh, don't let a school tell you that they don't test for it or that they don't identify it or um, that the child is too young, uh, particularly if we know that there's been some problems or that we have to wait till second grade um, or that the child's going to grow out of it. If you suspect that a student has a difficulty, then as a parent or as a school personnel, you can request an assessment. Okay, that is where I finish, and I know that there's going to be another poll, and then they'll collect your questions, so I'm going to mute myself and let Mary take over. Great. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you. Knowing more about dysgraphia gives us empathy and insight, helps us understand the kids and their struggles. And thank you for some very specific ways we can help. I think that's uh, especially good for us parents and uh, teachers. So I'll give, uh, see if Brenda is ready. Got some questions we can answer here. Sure. Thank Um, you. Okay. I think what I'll do is I'm just going to uh, go through one at a time and we'll just see how many we uh, get to. All right. So the first question was, uh, what is the youngest age that a child can be diagnosed with dysgraphia? Well, just like learning to read, children have to learn to write. So I think we do need to give them that opportunity to have some instruction. But just like with dyslexia, we do start to see difficulties early. And so a lot of times you can use the other students in the class as kind of a, a you know, a way to, to, to look at it. You know, is this, you know, are most of them learning but we, we have to also think about the kind of instruction they're getting. Are they getting instruction? Are they being taught how to form the letters? Um, so that, that certainly is something to think about. But if they are, then you can, it's just kind of like reading or other issues. You start to see those kids who are getting it and they're, they're developing those writing skills. And you start to see those kids that are slower um, to develop that. So Oftentimes, we do see risk factors in kindergarten, so they they really should be given some time for instruction, and we certainly, just like reading, we can provide some intervention, but if we still see difficulties, then certainly, I'm not going to say an exact age, but I think we do have to look at the instruction and uh, whether any kind of intervention has been beneficial um, at all, but it doesn't mean we have to wait till a certain grade level or a certain age to look at it. I myself am a little hesitant to to say it too young, um, just because I do know there is some research that says handwriting continues to develop on through about high school. I'm not, I mean, not, not high school, but uh, junior high. So I think we do have to be a little careful about putting it on there too early. Um, okay, so the next question is, by what age does a student typically develop the ability to automatically retrieve letters and write them in a legible manner? Well, um, again, I don't think I'm going to say a certain age, but children are exposed to print in our language um, certainly at a very early age, whether, you know, uh, they see see it in the stores, they see it in their home, if the parents read their books. So it's, it's very similar to reading. Orthographic processing develops by exposure, exposure to the letters um, by either being read to, by reading, uh, seeing the letters. And then uh, once you begin giving them some instruction in writing, just, you know, watching how automatically they're able to make those connections. So I think it's just really um, being aware that we want that automaticity to occur along the way, but um, not expecting it just to happen overnight. You know, kids, uh, there's a development of of writing skills just as there is a development of reading skills. So we do have to wait for um, those stages to kind of work through. 
But I think you can actually start to see it um, in kids. Like I will give you an example of this little kiddo that I work with. He's he's just turned seven. So at six years old, he could tell me I can't remember what it looks like. So kids know, <laughs> you know, if, if you can talk to them in a – so um, – uh, so I think that um, you just have to really observe and uh, be aware. Uh, my fourth grader writes everything very quickly. He still mixes upper, uh, up, up lower and upper, and it's hard to read. Um, any suggestions to get him to slow down? Well, you know, I'm just going to be honest off the top of my head. I just don't think of anything. I think um, you're just going to have to, you know, he may need to just, you said fourth grader, he needs, he probably needs to start out with just some uh, instruction and letter formations. Kids can really become better at their letter formations. What happens when they're a little older, though, is that they have more writing assignments in class and so if if you don't really practice with them to get them to where they're able to use those more um those letter formations that you've been working more efficient they're going to always go back to what's more efficient for them writing fast and not writing them as um clearly so I think it's a matter of, you know, you're just someone, whether it's you at home or whether it's, it's, you know, school, if he needs intervention is really working on those letter forms. And hopefully as, as he does that too, he can slow down. Now he may always be a fast writer, but um, I don't know. I don't really feel like that's a good answer, but uh, that's kind of a new one. All right. So it's better to start. Uh, is it better to start teaching cursive from the start? Does cursive writing help with fluency when writing? Actually, research shows that it doesn't matter developmentally whether you start with cursive or uh, manuscript. Um, in my dyslexia intervention, many times I've had student. Well, I've had students in the past that I've just started them in cursive when they're for first grade, and they did just fine. Um, so it's not a matter of developmental. It's really just the instruction that we provide. The state right now, you know, says we start with manuscript in the lower grades. And I think now the Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills says we start to introduce cursive in second. But I guess what we have to really consider, and, and unfortunately this happens, is that we have some kids that haven't really become automatic and then all of a sudden we're switching to a different script so um i don't i think it's up to the school i don't think it's i don't i don't know that i can say it's a mistake it's it's just whatever the school decides but developmentally there's not uh one that they have found is more beneficial than another Okay, how are how is the milestone of kids no longer re, how is the milestone of kids no longer reversing letters after the age of se, uh, after the age of s 7 playing a role in dysgraphia or orthographic to, no longer reversing letters after the age of 7. Well, reversals are just one aspect. I mean, uh, certainly um, I know that the kids that I work with, I, I have to spend more time working on reversals, not only in their reading or their writing, but um, even if they get to the point where they're able to, um, to where those don't bother them as, as much, it doesn't take away from the fact that they're dysgraphic or dyslexic. So, um, it's just one thing that we see that they have difficulty with. How does dysgraphia affect math? Um, it would only be in the, the formations of the numbers. So you may see difficulties learning to form the numbers. You may see uh, reversals uh, with the numbers. How would you provide intervention virtually? That's a great question. <laughs> I think um, if you... If you can provide, if you have something that you feel like you can you can teach letter formations with initially uh, online, 
uh, that's not going to be enough unless they can practice. So there's going to be, there's going to need to be somebody who takes that information and practices with them because obviously it's going to be very difficult to actually practice online. But um, certainly you could provide some initial instruction online. What strategies have you used to help students practice? Um, what will help them overcome challenges rather than continuing continuing with dysfunctional accommodations they have created for themselves? Um, um, uh, you know, quite honestly, dysgraphia requires instruction and letter formations primarily. Um, so I know that may seem a little more comfortable to do with younger kids, but it will also benefit older kids. Now, as I said before, older kids have more writing requirements as they get older. So because of that, until they can get more efficient with the instruction that you're providing them, then it may be appropriate to move them into some accommodations that can assist with their either getting the information that they need to out, whether it's through typing or orally, or to take it in. So, you know, and, and if the accommodations are dysfunctional, then I think you need to visit with the school. Uh, you certainly want accommodations to be beneficial for the students. So if you feel like the, the accommodations are not benefiting, then that might be a reason to uh, have some conversations with the school. Is there a scale to assess the rate for writing an alphabet sample? Um, there are some informal scales that you can find in some of the <laughs> sorry, writing protocols. Um, so there are some formal assessments that can be given that also provide some ways to look at that in a more formal way. So my answer is yes, but uh, you know you might have to uh, contact me individually for that. Is the priority to help correct the problems or to provide accommodations? Um, the priority, I think it depends on the child. I, I think that um, <clears throat> if they're younger, I, I, I don't think there's any reason why you shouldn't always to try to correct the problem. But I do think that... Um, some kiddos, even after you've given them intervention and you provide a lot of extra assistance with the handwriting, if they're still having difficulties, then the priority at that time is accommodations. We've got to give them ways that they can um, show their knowledge in the classroom. And some of that is using uh, more technology. And there are different levels of technology, as I indicated, uh, or as you were provided on that, the sheet that I gave you. And so um, some students, just like in dyslexia, we know students are mild, some students are mild, some students may be more severe, and we may see that with the handwriting issues too. And um, so I think we've got to look at it case by case, um, uh, student by student. Uh, in my opinion, does monocular vision play into either or both dysgraphia or dyslexia. Um, and this one specifically indicates that their son only has one eye. Um, this tends to be controversial. Now you've got a very specific uh, difficulty with the student. I think that certainly is a medical question. So I think I would really ask you to touch base with um, the the optometrist or ophthalmologist, but I do know there is information related to dyslexia that it is not related to vision. So um, if a student has vision difficulties that causes visual motor problems, we may see that also come out in uh, the handwriting. Okay, okay, so... Um, 
If a student has trouble tying shoes and other similar hand motor activities, what should they be evaluated for if that is not dysgraphia? Typically, that is something that uh, typically occupational therapists are the ones who work more on the motor issues. So if it's uh, pretty severe, then you could, and the child's already receiving special ed, it typically is a related service, then you could request that that be done. If the child is not in special ed, then you might want to look at that um, outside uh, getting a, or, a occupational therapy evaluation. You could certainly always work on letter formations and that kind of thing, but um, if there are other aspects of their fine motor issues, then um, that would be an occupational therapist. Uh, okay, I kind of lost my place. My child has, well, as people put things in, it keeps moving it. My child has dyslexia. Can the school test for dysgraphia as well? Yes. Um, you can request that. Um, any suggestions for a 20-year-old student that continues to struggle with dysgraphia? Um, I would suggest accommodations <laughs> at that point. Uh, not accommodations, but technology. To, to, to learn to use technology uh, at that age. Uh, my son has an IEP meeting soon. I have requested an accommodation intervention for handwriting each year. For several years, they just say his handwriting is messy, but it gets better when he takes his time. He's in special ed for speech. Um, as a parent, you have a right to request an evaluation. Now, if they... The law says that if they decide that an evaluation is not appropriate, that they have to provide you written evidence of refusal. So if they're going to continue to refuse to evaluate, you need to ask for a written document that they put in writing as to why they're refusing to do that evaluation. So uh, because that gives you the documentation you need if you feel that there is a, a reason for any kind of legal action. But if you've requested it and the school is saying it's messy, then uh, I think there's certainly no reason why it couldn't be looked into. Uh, I'm sure my child has a scrappy after listening to this. I'm a certified elementary teacher in homeschool. Do I need a count? Can I try these methods alone? Do I need a formal evaluation? Um, um, I think you can, I mean, that's up to you. I mean, that is certainly your decision. If you feel like you want an evaluation, you can certainly look at having an evaluation done. You could, since you're a certified elementary teacher in your homeschooling, you can start working on letter formations with the child, um, <clears throat> see what kind of progress they make, and then maybe go from there. Uh, you don't say what child, what what age the child is, but um, but you might start out and work with them on your own, and then if you feel that an evaluation is necessary, you could look into that. I have four kids, two severely dyslexic, um, dysgraphic, and ADHD. Two not. My dyslexic ten-year-old has no signs of dyslexia, but certainly signs of dysgraphia. It's very frustrating. He limits his writing. Other issues are not riding a bike, cannot tie his shoes, and has not desire to learn to swim. Um, so can you be dysgraphic with dyspraxia, but not dyslexic? Um, okay. It sounds like there are other issues besides just writing, uh, gross motor issues, fine motor issues. This could be developmental coordination disorder. I'm not not a doctor, but sometimes when you have a, a child who has more involved motor issues, that may be the reason. Certainly, it's going to also affect their handwriting. But yes, you can be dysgraphic without being dyslexic. Uh, what do you call it if a child can't form numbers either, but understands them? Well, it could be a part of the of, of the writing issue. Now, if they if they have problems with the numbers but not the letters, then that uh, typically is kind of like ADHD. It's going to affect everything. If you have orthographic processing issues that affect your writing, you're going to see it in both writing the numbers and writing the letters. So um, typically you're going to see it 
with any kind of writing they're having to do. Fourth grader being homeschooled, reads about second grade level, has both dyslexia and dysgraphia. Proven interventions for dysgraphia. Uh, but if I write them for him, it goes into a big black box. How can I balance developing his grade level skills while remediating his weak foundational skills? Should I just focus on the letter word and sentence skills? Let's see, he's in fourth grade. Well, I would certainly look on work on letter formations, but I think it's also good to begin typing. Uh, the as I said, the some of the gurus in the area of writing have really suggested that we begin typing with kids early on, and uh, not just for kids that have difficulties, um, because using laptops, computers, and so forth is just so uh, predominant in our society. So it certainly wouldn't hurt to begin working on letter formations, but also to begin uh, some typing instruction for him. Um, after diagnosis, what should I do first to help my 10-year-old fourth grader see a specialist? Uh, again, that's up to you. If you feel comfortable in looking at helping him uh, learn his letter formations, I think if we go back to what dysgraphia is, it's difficulty with letter form production. So I think always beginning with letter form production uh, uh, formations, working on those letter uh, forms. Now, if you if you see that there is difficulty holding information in their mind's eye, then you've got to also work on that. But and you can kind of work on it simultaneously, working on being able to recognize those letters really quickly and automatically and so forth, but then also working on the letter form production. And then at, at some point you can do more of a combination, but uh, but if you feel more comfortable looking uh, for a specialist to help you, certainly that would be appropriate. Motor feedback usually is related to proprioception. There's a huge deficit with students receiving occupational therapy in school settings when, in fact, it is needed, such as we see in motor feedback. Your thoughts, please, regarding OT services in schools. I, you know, I, I, I don't know that it, it's going to matter what I think. Um, we know, uh, I'm just going to throw this out, we know that even if a student is uh, under 504, that they can be provided related services, but that, I'm just going to tell you, is a district decision because, unfortunately, 504 does not have the funds that special ed does, so therefore, many times, they don't have the funds to provide related services and occupational therapists and very specialized uh, training for students. Um, so um, it would be great if it could be provided for those kids that need it. But, uh, but I will say sometimes the more kids that are referred, then they tend to will take the students that are more um, needy. Um, and that there are certainly some things that can be done in the classroom that, I mean, letter form production, learning to form their letters. I Quite honestly, I don't see why a teacher can't do that in intervention. So it's not like it would necessarily have to be an occupational therapist to provide that. Um, how do you address the issue of first and second grades learning and using manuscript in the classroom and in small pullout therapy sessions being taught cursive? Um, I, you know, that's a great question. I, I don't, I, I, you know, I don't know what, you know, if, it, if it's not confusing to the child, then great. It, in some ways, it's kind of like learning two languages. You know, you, you learn, the, you just learn more letter formations, learning more dance steps, I guess, so to speak. But um, if you have a child that it's really being confusing for, then, you know, so you may just have to think about it uh, child by child. Do kids with dysgraphia generally have trouble with typing too? Um, uh, no, because, uh, well, well, I'm just going to say maybe not just blanket no, but not necessarily. Uh, if there's motor issues, then perhaps. If it's due to orthographic processing, then um, because when you type, you remember if you've been if you've been taught to type, then you you have you learn where your fingers go on the keyboard. And so 
you're not necessarily now you're still going to have to be able to know how the letter is spelled and be able to pull it up in your head and if if you have problems with that then regardless of how well you type you're not going to know okay is that an a is that a you know what 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 letter is it that i typed so there could be children who can learn to type that may still have difficulty because they may still spell phonetically for that reason uh, because of orthographic problems. It's not going to necessarily take all of their spelling issues away. And neither will spell check, uh, by the way. If you don't know how a word is spelled, spell check isn't going uh, to help you. Now, if you have a student and here's where spell check could be beneficial. If you have a student who can recognize the words but just has trouble recalling the words, then the spell check may be beneficial. But uh, you can't just say, oh, we've got spell check. It's going to solve all their problems. No, not necessarily. What are all the accommodations that schools should be providing for dysgraphia? Well, I don't know that I can say what all accommodations, but typically, just like in dyslexia, we have some very specific ones. I think if, if they're slow, then they either need more time or you need to maybe not expect them to do as much writing, uh, maybe provide them more um, things that they just fill in blanks or that kind of stuff. Certainly, if you're not providing typing uh, to all kids, and I, I'm kind of surprised that it's not learning to type is not provided in a lot of the computer classes that students go to. They're learning how to do other things on computers, but they're not necessarily learning how to type. I think that would be beneficial. Uh, I know that's not a great response, but uh, what support do you recommend for students with dysgraphia? Hi, Mary. I see you. I was going to say, why, why don't you take one or two more, and then it's about okay. time for us to let you go. Uh, how do I improve my child's spacing between words and writing on a line? Um, I, you're just going to have to practice. You can give them a little, uh, a lot of times we say use a finger space or you could get something that they could use initially to provide that space. And then as they get more uh, familiar, then you might be able to remove that. Um, who should evaluate for dysgraphia? Um just like with dyslexia, if you understand it, if you know what to do, if you know how to uh, feel like you have been provided a training for assess, assess for it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a diagnostician. It doesn't have to be an OT, but you, you certainly need to have someone who understands what it is and knows what they need to do to evaluate for it. Okay, there we go. Sorry, yeah. I didn't get to everybody. Now, and, and basically, if you're going to get help at school, you need to get the school involved, right? And right, helping, right, because right. Otherwise, uh, they're not going to be on, on board with it. And they've got the resource, or the, they know who they got uh, available for you. But I'm, I'm speaking for all of us and Nyhaus and myself. Thank you, Brenda, for sharing well, your thank time you again. and your expertise. We really appreciate it. I'm going to try here to uh, share my screen to um, let people see the, um, let's see here. Why isn't that there? That's, of course, we go to this. And I want to get to the one that says you can call us at Nye House anytime, but that's not it. And this isn't it. And there it isn't. And there it isn't. Yeah, this is where you can uh, find us. Uh, there, so we have a recording of this video if you'd like to access that. Um, or if you want to call us about anything else, here's the Nye House at FSO. This is Family Support Office, or there's our phone number. I want to remind you that we have two more programs in the next few weeks. Uh, our next Friday's at Nye House is with Evan Weinberger, who's the CEO of Staying Ahead at the Game. He's going to talk about tips for virtual virtual learning success. Uh, that's on Friday, October 2nd, and the details and registration are on the website. Uh, and our, then the following Monday evening, evening on uh, October 5th, we have our fall college share program for high school students and their parents. Uh, Amir Barr is back by popular demand because we had him uh, back in February and people uh, who missed it asked for more. So this one is about uh, the synergy of technology and dyslexia. So Amir is somebody who knows a lot about that and is very helpful and can speak well to uh, high school kids 
and us adults. So thank you again to Brenda. Thank you to you all for being here. Uh, thank you for your continuing support. Uh, and we hope you have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye.